There we go. All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Rob Hamilton. I'm co founder and CEO of AnchorWatch. Uh, this isn't really a talk about what I'm doing today at my company, but more about the underlying technology that we're using to leverage for our, our solution, which is Miniscript. Uh, at a very quick high level, Miniscript came out of Blockstream back in 2019 with Songhead, uh, Buell, and uh, Andrew Polstrom all coming together. The ultimate mission was making it more approachable to be able to use Bitcoin. Um, in more advanced scripting scenarios, and I'll go through a high level today of what the problem is being solved and what the problem is that currently exists. So first off, just at a high level, what is Bitcoin script? So this is a language that Satoshi actually invented with Bitcoin. Uh, it is a stack-based language, uh, reverse Polish notation, very similar to fourth for anyone who knew uh, back in the 80s was programming with that. Uh, it's ultimately the rules that govern how a Bitcoin transaction can be spent, right? Um, you can push data onto the chain, like a public key. You can also have instructions, which we call opcodes, right? And opcodes are these instructions on what to do with the elements that are on the stack. So you have object sig, object multisig, things we probably know, but maybe less known is that there's other like logic gate functions like op if and you know op else. So you can have different kinds of conditions in how you encumber your Bitcoin. Uh, so when a transaction is broadcasted, uh, this is part of the goals of what every node does. It goes through all of the transaction data to be able to verify that it is being following the rules of the Bitcoin script that is encumbered by the address. A uh, script is considered valid if the value is greater than one. Uh, it auto fails though for certain opcodes. These are the ones that have the verified opcodes. So object sig verify and object multi sig verify, whereas object sig and object multi sig just do a zero one for true false. And as a quick high level, this is what it looks like to do a paid public key hash, right? You push your script sig, your signature, and the public key. You then uh, pop off the key, you use opdu to duplicate the public key. You then hash that duplicated key. You then push the hash key onto the stack. You then uh, verify that they equal each other. And then you finally execute and see if the signature is valid, and you get a one, right? So this is how a legacy one address paid public key hash works. So what can go wrong? Everything can go wrong if you're doing anything custom. And there's a reason why we err on the side of caution in Bitcoin with very standardized script templates to make sure that you don't have unintended script executed outcomes, right? Um, that's probably large part why you know we use mainly multi-sig, right, and uh, single sig because it's very well understood the script behavior is there. Um, you know, this is also the other point for the standards and interoperability of different walls, making sure everyone knows and how to understand how to encode anything. If you were to ever do anything custom before Miniscript, you had to write custom parsers, custom witness generation, and all these different elements that Miniscript solves. So there's 256 opcodes. I think there's like 115 that are active today. Um, you know, just because we always use signatures in Bitcoin doesn't mean you couldn't generate an address that doesn't require a signature, right? This could be in any way you can spend. You could just have a hash lock. You could just have some, you know, you know, a time lock. Like, and you know, that's a concern because then anyone who sees that transaction in pool could try and steal that transaction. There's also a bunch of defunct opcodes. Um, only two people at Riga knew the answer to this. I'm curious here. I, I have a feeling it's going to be much higher. Who knows what op verb is? Matias knows because I told him. And then, uh, so op verb is op version. So this was part of the original um, client in Bitcoin where you actually push the version of your Bitcoin client to the stack, which means it's effectively op hard for it, right? If I am running version 23, you're running version 25. And we push this opcode onto the stack, we're going to get different actual addresses because we're changing the actual script metadata. And when we hash it and put it to base 58, you're going to get an entirely different address. So that was quickly deactivated. And then you have other opcodes like opcat or concatenating, XOR, multiplication, division. There's a lot of them that have been deactivated. Uh, some of them uh, you're allowed to have in the script path, but as long as it's not invoked in the script stack, uh, it'll fail. And other opcodes will actually just automatically fail if that opcode is in there, even if it's not executed. Uh, additionally, another way something can go wrong is you can um, do a time lock mismatch. So for time locks in Bitcoin, you have absolute time locks and relative time locks. Uh, uh, relative time locks is ch check sequence verify, and that's based on the relative time of when funds enter the address. And op check lock time verify, which is based on an absolute unit in time. Uh, you can combine op check lock time verify and op check sequence verify, which is not a problem. But there's two ways you can keep time in Bitcoin. You can have the uh, block height, or you can actually put an epoch timestamp. And that follows bit 113, which is the minor consensus for the valid timestamps uh, for the current network state. You can also encumber a transaction to say, follow bit 113. So you can say, 
instead of block height a million, you could say on January 25th, January 1st, 2025, you know, you could actually execute a spend branch. But if you were to include both a script height, uh, a block height, and a epoch timestamp in the same script stack, it will break your bit, uh, it will like break the transaction. This was something they actually found when they were going through the script interpreter building mini script that there are ways that you can just use time blocks which we intuitively think would be acceptable because it's not using that opcode and it will actually break your stack. This is a cool thing actually as a side note with Taproot. Um, Super Testnet, I know it's floating around here at Bitcoin Plus Plus back in April in Austin. He did a really cool um, smart contract where he used tap leaves. So you would have one block, one tap leaf that used a block height and another one that used an epoch timestamp. And he used that to do a proof of concept for a synthetic like a hash rate derivative because you can place a bet on what's going to be satisfied first, the timestamp or the block height. So you can go long and short hash rate that way. Um, but if you're using payment with script hash and all of it's in there and you're executing, it will fail. So that's another thing that can go wrong. Additionally, malleability. So SegWit, as we all know, fixed transaction malleability for the TX ID, but you still have the witness, which can be malleated because it's not signed. So when you make a custom script, you need to be careful and make sure that there aren't ways that your transaction can be malleated so someone can maliciously reorder the witness in a way where they can execute an unintended sprint branch or they could you know, possibly take money. So, uh, those are like all big problems, but let's say you've kind of avoided all of those, right? And you've made a valid script. Just because you made a script doesn't mean when it's time for you to actually spend the money, you're actually gonna be able to do that, right? So you have to actually construct a witness to be able to operate. And I was actually talking with Sonica yesterday, and that was one of the original motivations for Miniscript was, you know, uh, Andrew Chow is like doing more custom scripts with PSBTs, and the PSBT finalizer role, for those who aren't familiar, takes all of the signature data, all of the hash images, all of the data, and it tries to arrange it with the script to create a valid Bitcoin transaction. So uh, this is a, one of the great things that Manuscript does. If you're gonna make a crazy advanced multi-sig, you're actually gonna be able to uh, have this automatically solve for you. So if you have a Manuscript compatible uh, script, you'll actually be able to have it in this automatically generated for you. So with all the things that can go wrong, what is Manuscript? The whole purpose of it is to create a simplified approach for analysis uh, and security, as well as the composition of them. So the composability is really interesting because instead of maybe a two of three, where maybe it's a two of three generic multi-sig you know today, I can have my own very, as my company, have a very involved uh, script like redemption scheme, and I can have another company that has a crazy involved uh, scheme and a third one, and you can combine all three of these together into one two of three, but not two of three keys, two of three policies that can all roll into each other. Right? And you can kind of interoperably, any leaf that you have in Manuscript output descriptor, you can plug in an entire other Manuscript truth into it. So uh, what's really great is that it's verifiable. Uh, you, you can have visual representations I'll get into in a moment that allow you to actually verify um, semantically whatever you've got in your mouth is being satisfied with the Bitcoin script. It's also hyper-optimized. So it's actually able to do, uh, for whatever policy that you give it, it will give it the most compressed amount of bytes as possible. <laughs> and this is really interesting because it actually can do bulk three invoices more efficiently than bulk three spend. Now, it's not never changed because it was a lot of, you know, tech, a lot of uh, tech debt and a lot of man hours that went into building out the current infrastructure. But it's interesting to show that computers are just really good at hyper-optimizing and uh, you could, being able to do things that, you know, hundreds of hours went into trying to understand how to create lightning HDLCs can be done even more efficiently than mainstream. So, that's the high level breakdown of what it's trying to do. What are the three actual building blocks? You know, you have Bitcoin signatures, we all know and love them, we use them every day. Um, hash locks, where if you reveal a pre image, you can actually satisfy that. And then finally, time blocks, which I mentioned before, you have absolute relative, and just to clarify, as I didn't mention earlier, an absolute time lock would be meet me at 4 p.m. tomorrow versus meet me in 12 hours, right? One's based on a relative context of where we are in time, and one's an absolute. And then uh, finally, also block height and epoch timestamp, but you can't do both. Uh, for relative time locks, I think that's where a lot of people that are building in Bitcoin are more interested in, uh, as because it, it functions basically as a dead man switch, because the relative timer begins the moment the funds get confirmed on chain. Uh, the downside, though, is that Op check sequence verify is only a two to the 16 bit number. So you can only go out as far as 65,000 blocks, which is roughly 15 months. So you can't do a dead man switch in the sense of like, if the money hasn't moved in three years, activate this other spending branch, right? You're constrained to two to the 16. So if you do an epoch time, the way it works is that it's 
like 12 months, and then for block ID, you can get it up to like 15 months, assuming the hash rates are roughly constant. So now with all that background out of the way, uh, talking about what is a mini script policy, this is the high level analyzable human readable language or close enough to that, um, where you can also diagram it out. The tool I have here is the Bitcoin Dev Kit Playground. Huge shout out to them. Um, we're using Bitcoin Dev Kit, it's a really powerful workhorse that kind of builds on top of Rust Bitcoin and Rust Mini Script to be able to allow basically a Swiss Army knife to build whatever you're whatever you're looking to build for a whole wallet solution without having to you know start at square one and implement a little bit of cryptography. So here we have a mini script policy where we have uh, two different possible spending conditions. Well, the first one is a two of three with key one, key two, key three. And then we have a second possible spending condition, which is folder 144, so 144 blocks, which is a day. And then you have key four and key five. So immediately there's two different thresholds. That's something that isn't often seen today. Additionally, the, the backup one, the bottom policy, uses entirely different keys, which is an interesting concept in the fact that like, it's not just two of three that maybe becomes one of three. You can have different forms of people be able to sign and move money and using time as a security element. Uh, this is what you see here at the high level in white. That's the manuscript policy. Um, the interesting thing here too is the weights. Manuscript is part of the optimization adjustment. You can execute and say, this spending path is 10 times more likely to happen to this other spending path, and that will actually go into the construction of the script itself to make sure that if you're going to use a path more frequently, you're going to use the path that's going to save the most bytes. And then if you have something that's less efficient and less likely to happen, it'll uh, deprioritize it in the, in the script execution so that it's better to have it than not have it all if you walk out of your money, but it's going to optimize for your most used uh, possible case. And this is what it breaks down to here, right? So you have your threshold for the two, two of three keys for key one, key two, key three. And then the second branch of the four is wrapped within an and. You have an and with an older time lock, and then the key four, key five, right? Um, that's the other thing. Just think like signatures, hash locks, time locks, and or threshold. Yeah, and just to clarify, the, the, uh, is it the 10 app that's the waiting here? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the 10 is the, the wait. That's you can see up here. Like that's your 10 weight, your one weight, and that gets encoded. And that gets encoded with the at symbol for uh, 10 at and saying that this branch is that number. Same question. Yeah. Same question. Got it. Uh, just, uh, just to explain, uh, what is the difference between mini script and mini script policy? Yeah, so we're going to get that in the next slide. So the difference between mini script and mini script policy. So the policy has nothing to do with Bitcoin actual execution, right? There is, this is not an output descriptor, this is just a diagram analyzable fragment that you could you know, sit down and understand the full possible spending branches and execution, but you can't plug the policy into Bitcoin core, right? You need to use the manuscript compiler, which we'll get out on the next slide here. So you can take this high level semantic analyzable, um, close enough to human readable English, and you put it into the manuscript compiler currently, there's the one that's SIPA built in C++, and then uh, Andrew Bolscher built one in Rust uh, manuscript frame. So the whole idea here is that it'll parse the policy, it'll optimize the script size, it'll sanity check to make sure there's no foot guns, and it'll turn it into an output descriptor. So you can actually see here, these are using testnet like private keys, right? But you can also put in extended public keys if you're using a wallet that's going to maybe have many 32 derivation paths. And you can see here, you know, you have the script hash, you have the or statement, You have the order though. Right. You have the or statement here. You have your threshold with the raw um, the keys, and then this is your second branch with the and argument, where it's an and wrapper for this threshold. And then all the way at the end over here, the second condition in the board is that older one forty four, right? And then you get a checksum for your output descriptor as well as sanity check it and make sure that yeah, when you're cross validating across different wallets, that the checksum is satisfied. So, really cool tool, uh, Minsk, M-I-N.S-C, um, actually is a one layer of abstraction beyond the manuscript of policy, where you can actually have, here on the left hand side, you have a liquid-like federation, where it's a two of three, and you flag it as it's most likely, or you have some timeout period, here it says three months, and then it has a recovery statement. You can actually see how that um, Minsk code compiles into a Bitcoin policy, uh, sorry, a manuscript policy, into a manuscript output descriptor, into Bitcoin script, into an actual address. So this shows the entire continuity from the idea of a mini script policy all the way down to where it actually goes into an address on chain.
So at a high level here, uh, just tools that are uh, building with many scripts. Uh, Bitcoin Core has a version 25 added read and sign support. I think version 23 also had read only support. So you actually can now uh, load it with a user output for your Bitcoin Core. You're able to uh, verify addresses. You can actually construct DSPCs as well. Um, Rust Miniscript is great, uh, the Bitcoin Dev Kit project. Um, someone uh, pointed out Riga is actually Bitcoin Labs and they're working on a TypeScript implementation of it. Highly experimental, but the idea is like making it for wherever you are in the tech stack, you're able to use uh, different languages to leverage this. And Bitcoin Dev Kit also has the foreign language bindings. So you can actually take all of the Rust bindings and compile them to Kotlin, Swift, um, React Native, and Python, right? So wherever you are in the tech stack, you can start leveraging this stuff by building on top of those foreign language bindings. High level, um, the wallets that are using this, uh, Wizards are named by Women's Leona Crew. They're formerly, they built the product Revolt. And uh, they're live on mainnet right now, and uh, they've been using many scripts. It talks directly to your node. It's an open source GUI you can download. And their main scheme that we're using it for is, uh, let's say, N of M, and then some relative time lock, and then N of M, right? So you can have a two of three become a one of three, you have a two of three become a two of five, and add two backup emergency keys, right? That all works within the on. My Citadel um, is an RGB wallet as well, uh, has full nature support. Um, there's my company, Anchor Launch, which we're using um, for custody solutions and insurance. And then there's a new uh, team, uh, they're formerly known as Coinster, uh, the Smart Vaults team. They just finished Wolf Core War II. I was chatting with Max earlier this week, the CEO on Twitter. Um, they're doing some really cool products and they have it all working right now with Monster Pub Keys, where you can actually use this as a way to kind of like secure and manage your funds. And it helps with all the coordination and they have uh, apps as well. Uh, and then signing devices, this has been the big push because previously um, I started working on building our product Trident, which uses Miniscript uh, in November. And the biggest, the biggest limitation was that there was no hardware on support. You basically had to use your own custom tool like we're coding up. It wasn't in Bitcoin Core yet. Um, Salvatore and Ledger was the first one to implement it, which kind of like set everyone up in motion. Uh, we also now have the Spectre DIY, I think actually was the first one to support it. And then Ledger added support uh, in December last year, they rolled it out. So any Ledger Nano OS Plus or X or even the full Nano OS all support it. If you update to the latest firmware, uh, you have the cold card, which now supports it. The Bitbox O2 just added firmware for it live in production last week. I haven't integrated it yet, but they are using, uh, they have Rust bindings. And you can either use Rust or you can use um, JavaScript bindings in Rust. So if your web wallet or your desktop wallet, whatever, you can uh, connect it with them. And then the Blockstream J, which I'm quite reasonably sure is coming very, very soon. So just as a Additional just shout out if you're wanting to code around on your own time, the Bitcoin Dev Kit Playground. We'll be also using BDK Elephant today, which is kind of an extension on top of BDK Playground, where if you want to start building custom fragments messing around, it's a great tool because it uses Wasm, so it compiles everything in the browser. So if you want to make a crazy, arbitrary Bitcoin testnet, just like manuscript policy, to start clicking around, you use that. It uses the BDK CLI. Um, and then just as a really quick example for uh, an idea like what we're using for, we're going to be open beta next week with our product Trident. You can have a three of five multi sync, and for the sake of the beta, I made very short time locks. And it's a three of five, but not three of five keys. It's three keys in two time lock conditions. So you actually, this is the idea of uh, kind of compressing down what maybe people call a degrading or a decaying multi sync, where uh, it starts off as a three of three, and then three days go by, and you have it become a two of three, and then when a week goes by, it's a one of three. Right, so these are the five different conditions. You can pick any of the three, and uh, it actually spits out to a whole output descriptor. And as just a high-level example, what this actually looks like in Bitcoin script, uh, you have your script stack on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is the witness. Um, what you do is you, uh, I should make this step-by-step -step slides, but you uh, put signature three, compare this to the key three, you get a one if it's valid, and with object save, and then you do op swap, where you now put uh, signature two next up on the stack, and you put the one behind. Oh, no. And uh, you recursively, you then do the next signature check. You get an object save for one, and then use op add. So you took the one and the one, you made it two. We need to satisfy key three and key two. And then finally, you do it one more time where you take the two, swap it out, and then you do the final key check, object save, add. And then um, you then go through the rest of the branches, and then the witnesses that are right here, with one, have you skip over the time lock. 
problems. So that you're actually just going to get to the bottom where you push the number three and do pop equal, and you've satisfied your three conditions. And this allows you to have the same script stack where if you're actually going to invoke the time locks, your witnesses here would be zero and one, or zero and zero, depending on if you're using one time lock or both time locks, and it all compiles out to the valid script. So, questions? If I would use read script and get a write policy, I probably need to keep the backup of all my text entries. And is it sufficient to just get the policy to always be able to find my transaction again, or what do I need? You need the output just right there. Yeah, so if, just like the moment you leave single sig um, and you don't have enough key information on hand with just the one expert that you know, your seed phrase to be able to regenerate it. Just like if it was a legacy 203 multi-sig or anything that isn't just a single sig, you need the output descriptor. Because the output descriptor provides the set of instructions to be able to derive this script path so that you can actually provide the redemptions to be able to take your money off the chain. And then the core idea is that for each expert key, you always derive the keys at the same index so you can easily track them or? So for deriving individual keys, like for a bit 32 wallet? Yeah. Yeah, so um, by default, um, it would just start at index zero, but you can do any sort of, if you want to have different keys incrementing, you can customize that on your side. And you can copy that, but it, I guess it's kind of hard if, for example, signature one is at index 20, and signature two is at index 15, you can just get quite a lot. Yeah, my recommendation, and this is what we're doing for like a key rotation, if I like lost my key, is increment an account ID, so you go back and reset the whole wallet back to index one, because otherwise, you're right, if you have XPub1 is on index 0 and XPub2 is on index 20, you're going to have issues finding like finding those public keys. So I think it's just best to always start on index 0, and if for whatever reason you need a more rotator or swap out a key, just generate a new child XPub and just increment that account number. And that allows you to clean the slate. It does make a new wallet, but then it puts you in a position at least where you don't have to, that's like extra metadata you need to maintain if you're like all on different indexes. Uh, examples would be like having a spending condition branch that doesn't require a signature, right? Because if you just maybe only have a hash lock or something, then any miner could possibly steal it. It constructs the script as well to make sure that there's no malleability, so that even if you've coded something by hand, um, a malicious miner or peer could rearrange the witness and maybe spend something you didn't intend, and also things like mixing the time locks, right? So there's like that's a good umbrella category of like all different ways. I was wondering, if I didn't see this particular example in the slides. I was wondering if I didn't get uh, In the slide? Oh, the slides. This should, I'll update it, I'll update the GitHub after this with this slide. I just made a clone of it this morning, but it should be identical to the one I did at Riga. So, sorry about that. Yeah. Two of questions. Yes. Yeah. If you wanted to extend the time lock beyond the new route, is there any mechanism? So if you're doing a time lock further than a year out, um, so that you you could use, so just to rehash this, uh, relative time locks can only go two to the 16, so 65,000 locks. If you want to do a time lock that's longer than that, you can, you just need to leverage an absolute time lock, if that makes sense. So you could do an absolute time lock that's three years out. 10 years, yeah, you could. Yeah, and this is where like it gets very um, challenging for building applications around this because I'm of a strong mind, I think the way the industry is going to go is like a set of templates, because um, for one, for wallet interoperability, two, for cargo wallet interoperability, three, um, having uh, extra assurances that these script paths are well house tested and like are those confident in them. And finally, like looking at this right here, this is a very unique on chain footprint, right? This is the trade off here where it does get better with tax script. Many tax script is in the PR right now since March waiting to get reviewed and get merged in. But you can take all of these, this is a payable script patch, you can leverage this with you know, all the taproot logic as well to be able to actually have individual tap leaves so you're revealing less data and you're only having to show the, the exact range that you're trying to execute your script on. All of this can be said, um, you can use absolute time locks to do something that's further out if you want to do something that's three years or four years out. Yeah, inheritance is a massive opportunity here in this space, um, where you can have, I think it's where a lot of people are building like their like strategy around leveraging this right now. And I just think fundamentally, like what I want to impress on anyone here who's building anything is this using a tool like Vinny Script to actually start adding time as a security variable 
or you can threshold to thresholds. So it would be my two of three plus your two of three. So at a very high level, that's how part of what we're using makes your foreign ankle watch is that for the life of the insurance policy, we are required co-signers. But when the insurance policy expires and we're no longer holding risk and your contract expires, they can go back to just being your keys. Right, so we're not a custodian in that sense compared to like maybe a bit or a firebox where you're keeping all of your cryptographic data with someone else. This is you know trying to find different interesting custody networks to have more synergistic business relationships and ability for companies to add value in a way that you can still maintain sovereignty. Yeah. Well, it's a tech tree to getting this you know, this kind of more private information that uh, yeah, the, the way I would actually think about making this more private is using like Frost and USIC, where you can just start aggregating all of these like groups of keys into single keys. Um, I think that's genuinely the best because right now we're just pushing one public key per like device on chain. You could have you could leverage Taproot with MPC in such a way where almost everything looks like single city or like one or two keys being a time lock argument, and that's a way to definitely abstract a lot of this data on chain to where it's a smaller footprint. Uh, I think the other thing in general, this is the idea with templates, is that with templates, you would have a greater crowd to hide it, so it's not just your unique on chain footprint. That would be the other thing I've been thinking about too. Can you combine MPC with uh, Miniscript? Yeah. Oh. yeah, you can. So you can combine MPC with Miniscript, and for anyone who's seen me and Ryan now uh, doing our little shit posting boards on Twitter, that's actually the entire joke. Is that with Taproot you can do both TaskScript and Schnorr signature MPC, and that's actually like it's very synergistic and nice. So that's actually it, it's a great that has the actuation to MPC game versus TeamScript is that we can coexist. That's the whole joke of it. Let me grab a different too. What's the way to do this? So recently I was putting together a policy that included generation cloud and we got a server on the I'm going to create one first example from which I could make other. Uh, and it's hard to find an example of that, you know. So I, I eventually found, uh, you know, kind of here just a little bit by trial and error. Uh, I was wondering if there are any good examples of these sorts of things uh, where you can go and where you see examples that work. Yeah. So um, the BDK playground. If you check that out, there's an example tab on there, yeah. and it actually has example rough templates. I guess one thing I didn't mention earlier, just to call out, you can't have the same public key multiple times with any major data descriptor. And the reason being um, is that you, if you put the same public key in multiple different branches, when you're providing that signature, you, you can't actually attest to like which branch you're trying to sign a commit to. So you need to have unique public key. So that's another thing you could use too, where if you want the same device to sign multiple times, you could have different derivation paths, but on the same device still. All that being said, this is another great thing just with you know using tap leads, is that you can just have that. You don't have to worry about having that same public key appear multiple times. It allows you to make it much more easier on uh, user experience as well. Because like the ledger allows you to do like max up, mass upload of like X hubs, or like you can generate a bunch of child X hubs and maintain that data somewhere else. Um, but having just that one key um, to be represented all the branches is a great way to streamline things. Yeah, I thought it was interesting just how you could uh, substitute private key in for one of the public keys that you know, you know and so you can use it for assigning as well as for yeah. trust generation. Yeah, it's it's highly flexible to, for whatever your specific need is. So there's a, I mean, talking with a lot of people, I think it's just an interesting opportunity space to start developing unique solutions and finding different ways of leveraging Bitcoin and kind of stepping outside of um, single sig and basic that we have today. Yeah. And, oh, um, one thing I noticed too, that, uh, there was a use of uh, square brackets uh, with, with regard to the private key and um, with, with the hash of the, of the root and uh, I just was wondering, um, you know, that was something I was sort of fumbling around with to get a good example of the work. And uh, um, can you talk about that part of the So the brackets, like if I were to go back to like here, like the, these brackets right here. So exactly, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. So so that those brackets right there are actually coming from the hardware wallet where it's the, the wallet fingerprint, the XFP, right? And then additionally the derivation path you're using, right? And that's where that plays a role. Um, it, it's also just streamlined too for when you're generating PSPTs, your hardware wallet can identify like what, what, what key is actually mined in this PSPT. So that's where it gets really streamlined. Right, so it, it provides like a, a, a breadcrumb trail. So when it's look, your hardware wallet's looking at this arbitrary it's script, it can do the math and be like, okay, these are the public keys I'm signing for. Okay, display information, confirm, that's you know, attach signature. Yeah. Isn't hardware wallet actually show the address? 
Yeah, so um, each wallet handles a different way. Um, after the workshop's done, I'm more than happy because I have ledgers and gold cards here and Inspector DIY, those are the ones I have running at the moment. I can show what signing looks like. The way the ledger handles it is it provides uh, a wallet registration process where it actually shows you the full output descriptor with the hex hubs. And once you um, confirm that, you have a, it basically signs a hash as an HMAC to be able to say, provide this security token whenever you want to interact with this wallet again to prove that you, the user, previously approved this, right? So you're not going to arbitrarily sign something. And that's, you know, for, as a stateless device, important. The way cold card handles it, since it has memory, is that you can just actually load the output descriptor and save it there. Um, actually, just to jump back to the ledger, the ledger just, once you do that registration process one time, the spending flow UX is identical to any other transaction. So it just says like, hey, you're spending this so much from this wallet, you know, this is your change, like, confirm, this is your fee rate, and it runs off the races, whereas the cold card kind of shows an optional full information on the screen you can scroll through. And uh, Spectre DIY 2 since it has a much bigger screen, it can take much greater liberty with displaying all the information in the context. But I think that's like, the moment you have these more advanced spending conditions, the like, screen real estate becomes a really sacred thing to try and optimize to make sure people have like knowledge and consent and how they're interacting with these more involved big hard scripts. So just to uh, clarify, uh, script in Coldcard, is it on the Edge framework or on the stage? Yeah. So the Miniscript, uh, yeah, so Miniscript functionality for the Coldcard is on their Edge firmware right now. So um, Rodolfo is very sensitive since there's a large install base of people that are using cold cards to hold very serious amounts of money. He doesn't want users to arbitrarily start messing around with this stuff and like have a problem. And talking with Rodolfo, he's also a very big proponent on this idea of templates, where it's not going to just be any arbitrary thing. Um, as someone who's making a software wallet leveraging this stuff, I'm really sensitive to that too, because um, I have a custom tool that basically lets you make any custom thing you want. But the last thing I want is for someone to make a time lock to block height six million and then yell at me because their money's locked, right? Because like you have to be careful about this stuff, right? There's ways you can mitigate it if you're only using relative time locks. You can't go out further than 15 months, which is nice. Um, we're using absolute time locks because we're actually pairing an insurance contract policy with the time locks on chain, right? So we need actual calendar dates because uh, we don't worry about the hash rate goes up or down and all of a sudden you're, you're, you have one year policy but then it expires sooner. So that's kind of why we're using the default time stamp. But yeah, it's on the cold card phone. Cool. No questions then. All right. There's a lot of people here, so this is going to be interesting. Um, so, what I was going to go do next. So, if you go to elephant.bitcoindevkit.org, it's a link in the uh, it's a link here in the GitHub repo, and I also have a Google Doc here that's open for and open for anyone to edit. Um, I think we have to be like. Crazy. Well, it uses taproot, so we're not going to hit a sick off slowing issue, but we can try and do a big mini script output descriptor like race. We can do make a whole custom policy here. What's great about Elephant is it takes you to this high level diagram, right, for making these custom policies. It actually creates a deposit address, and then it actually allows you to create PSBTs inside the broadcast. So we may have a bit of a coordination problem, but I think a fun thing we can do with mini scripts to actually kind of like show a different way of spending this money is we can do a race of the left side of the room versus the right side of the room. And if we do that, we could actually do two different thresholds and see who can actually sign and get their call transaction broadcasted first. I was not expecting this many people, but we could give it a try. So um, if everyone can just go into the, uh, if everyone can just, uh, as good crypto anarchists, self organize and start putting all of your names here on the participant list, I'll make a couple more spaces here. That is the issue. What's that? Yeah. That is the okay. yeah. yeah. issue. If everyone can just start dropping names in here, I guess I'll put that here first. And then everyone just start putting in names. And if no one wants to participate, we can just get two or three people to do it, just to kind of walk in the high-level process. But I wanted to use, I had a command line tutorial, which is also on the GitHub notes, but that's like by yourself and not fun, since we have everyone here to do a fun little interactive program. So, looking at this, this is, you also have to go to BDK and Elephant on your computer, but we can do, just to show initial, like, how this can work, we can have multiple thresholds here, right? So we can have it be, there's two ways to satisfy the money. We can have it be, you know, uh, two of three here. Put my key in here. 
and then you can actually make a different threshold, right? So, let's see, do you have anything? Uh, you, you need to allow edits. Oh, I thought I had it. That's, that's, that's a lot more. Everyone can edit. Does it not let you guys put them in? Everyone's trying. Everyone's self organized. Everyone's in the cell. But I don't know how to make it more editable, though. Anyone from Linux can edit. Editors can change permissions and share. You can also work deep range on the cells to be editable. That is well. I guess we just start calling out names. It's the other way of doing it, but that'll be it. That's actually it. Um, oh, that's why. Thank you. Ah, someone figured it out. Yeah, Perfect. All right, everyone, sorry. Go into the second tab. I'll delete this first tab. And we'll Give it a minute, and then after the minute, we'll just take those signatures and we'll move over to it. Is there another name in? Cool. I'm assuming, so we have... What's that? Left side, right side. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to do. Um, Alright, anyone over here, we'll call this left side. Anyone over here, we'll call this right side. So put in your... Uh, Yeah, for my, yeah. It's all about me. Which left and This is the right hand side, and then this is the left hand side. It's like you and me, right? Yeah, it's yeah, so like right, left, right, left. I was thinking the same thing. This is going as well as I expected. <laughs> Yeah, just put right or left. Is everyone's name on the left hand side for the use of this conference? Yeah. Shouldn't, shouldn't you just put the names on either left or the right side? You could. <laughs> but we all need to have consensus on this. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Are you saying it's really a consensus part? It's a little bit difficult. <laughs> yeah, this is my, I'm launching a blockchain that can figure this out. <laughs> So the one thing we have to do is we all, we're going to use mine as a reference because we all need to have the same exact template here. But if you go through, just start taking over the names, I'm going to start going down the list. So I have Alex Keith.
So the way this works, Elephant um, block to test net, definitely not secure, but what it's doing is it's taking every single person's name and it hashes it and it makes it into private keys. So you can actually use Elephant as a coordinator to do these more interesting script solutions like asynchronous, like, so we can all log into the server. Yeah, because there's a bunch of white space. That's a good point. White space. Um, I don't think it shows it actually. Yeah, so I would remove white space. How much time we have? 15 minutes? Let's see what it goes. So we, we need to do the same as we're doing, but with our name and the one on, on our yeah, side. Yeah, so your key, just make your name local key, whatever your name is, in the spreadsheet, and then just add everyone else's, and I'll show you what it should look like in a second. Both sides? Yeah. So yeah, so your name, so... But we should probably start with above, above and keep you, you, So the, the order of the remote keys doesn't matter, but on the picture diagram, it does matter. Because it's actually doing the, it's not doing like the 69 bucks graphical sorting, it's just whatever order you're putting the keys in, because the keys don't happen, so you'll get a different deposit address if you do it out of order. So the only problem is, do we have two errors here? Or is the error created twice? Oh, collision. Yeah, you have a collision. It's not the same. Another save. Oh, CMK. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Good save. So Eric, Eric with C. Yeah, I see that. Oh, I, I missed that. Oops. Good catch, Eric. There's a lowercase of it? Is there an uppercase of it too? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is a. Uh, we do have a. I guess we have a. Right. So now we're going to have, we have on each side, we have, okay, so let's just make it a three of six. It gives us some redundancy and some blood issues. So we do three of six, three of six. And now I'm going to do my key first. So for everyone on your side,
where it says my key, it should just be Rob. And then I'm going to be. We got Alex. So now we have transaction here. Yeah, sorry. Here's the order I have. Uh, yeah, it should be. What is my key? My key is your key in the process. So you're actually, wherever your name appears in the stack, just make it my key. So looking at this, my name, Rob, should be the top key in the first special. Scripts are being executed. If you have a path that you know is going to happen nine times out of ten, 
uh, the matrix compiler will optimize the script in such a way where that one will save bytes when it gets executed, and then the other one, which is less likely to happen, will be you know, further down the stack, less efficiently being used. But the point being is that you're better off still having that as an option versus not being able to spend your money, right? So in the circumstance you're using a less likely path, you're willing to pay that extra transaction fee. So it doesn't actually impact the volume, it's just... It, it impacts the order of the transaction, if that makes sense. So, uh, Elephant hash is your name, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so that is not in that, it's your case B. Why? Oh, is it the case B? Yeah. No, it's uppercase. Oh, now it's uppercase? It's uppercase in the spreadsheet. It's uppercase in the spreadsheet, yeah. Okay. Sorry. And lowercase there, but it's not in the spreadsheet. Sorry, Evan. Sorry, you're not in your PC game. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, like that not really doesn't like us. <laughs> Are you pulled that up? Oh no. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. The same wallet by the mental enable. Uh it means that you have one of the keys or duplicate. You have an invalid miniature policy. Okay. I'm just trying to I like, deposited funds and it hasn't shown up yet, so I'm trying to figure out why that's the case. Uh, you don't need to use all the keys. I guess the one thing to call out is that this is uh, a threshold, right? So you also need to make sure that this is a threshold of three. So it's a, there are two threes and sixes. Why are you not allowed to do one out of six? You can do one out of six. It should work. Uh, let me look and say it should. It should work. There's no reason why it wouldn't. So you'll know it's correct when you're able to see this wall that has sats in it. When you see it, I'll walk around in a second. You can see it? Is that cool? Yeah. So now it has a million sats on there. Um, and now the last, uh, who's gotten to get the address to show up on their side? Like, you, you have it? Yeah. Do anyone else? Right, I'll walk around in a second. The, the next step is just do create transaction, and you have to pick. You have to pick. You know, I'm going to satisfy this policy. Um, let me. I think I have it down here. This is discrimination. <laughs> 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 um, I'm going to drop it right here, just so because you all have to pick the same address that you're going to spend to. Pick this. <clears throat> oh, the address field right here. Go. So, if you just copy this value right here, in the amount, we're going to do 100 KSATs. So, you go to the create transaction screen, hit the destination, 100 KSATs. This is the top branch, this is the bottom branch, and you have to pick and be like, what sort of conditions might be satisfied. And just check three of these. And you actually have to use BT, but I'll Go around and check on who is stuck. Put, put on your wallet grid, please. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll leave this up. So we should move it actually. Have a bit yeah, yeah, but where it, says my, where it says my key, make that wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one person got it, so I know I didn't totally screw up. <laughs> you should see the address right here. When you hit home, you should see two transactions. I've got a million testnet and 100k testnet transactions. Oh. So it doesn't even hit the right address. You good? Yeah. All right, so you guys can start coordinating signatures. Yeah. I'll put this back for this. Yeah. And order, order matters, right? The order does matter. Yeah, that's, order, that's the order has to be the same because yeah. it's the encoding, it's the order that this the public keys are being pushed to the stack, so you get an entirely different address if you approach it. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. I think it should work now. Yeah, and you'll know it works when you go to the home screen, hit sync wallet, and you see an address, you see a fund with wallets in cases. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can use the Google spreadsheet now to coordinate your PSPTs. Wait. 
No, he does not. He does not. Yeah, that's, does what, that's what I'm saying. He said hash. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and yes. you, you add yourself to the. I think I think you were here, but yeah. you shouldn't be here, right? Because you are you are on the top. On oh, the top side. Oh, okay. that's yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Because yeah. the people yeah. below. Yeah. yeah. You're right. That's my. So. Go to home. Then hit C ball. So for a second, just to go back here, since I'm the top key, this is what it would look like. So, so, so you create a transaction function. You take the address in the spreadsheet. Put that as the destination address, and then take out the 100,000. And then if you're on the top branch of the picture, you want to pick the top branch of keys and just pick three. And this. And you'll have the necessary information, right? So this, 100,000. It's not you hit, you hit, you hit create. No, 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 it's a different address. But there are going to be like a single oh, okay. You can steal the test net funds. If you can collude with everyone to sign the same transaction output. So this is what it looks like when you get a dress. You get the amount. Now, spending policy, this is. Uh, how BDK actually mediates all of the different ways that you construct a PSBT is that it takes basically a hash map of all the different possible spending conditions and you get a condensed um, ID. And that ID is you pass into BDK's law operator to say, I want to spend from this branch or this branch, right? Um, the elephant tool here abstracts away so you get check boxes, but that's how the transaction gets constructed. And just to show, I can take this unsigned PSBT, I can sign the transaction. And then I can take this PSBT and then I can put it down over here and just drop it in my, my side PSBT. So then what you would want to do as a final step is once you everyone has all their PSBTs together, you can merge a broadcast. So I can put my PSBT here, and then I can take my teammates' PSBTs, right? Put them all in, merge them, and then hit broadcast. But I don't have enough signatures because it's just my key. But that's how you actually go through the rest of this. I got two minutes left. Well, we really think it's just like the same. What was that? The 370 does like the 70 keys. Uh, yeah, so I guess just for each side, just pick the top three. It shouldn't matter because we're in the stack. I guess it shouldn't matter, but I guess to be consistent, find the three sides where they are in the stack and just pick the same checkboxes. Yeah, I'm working. Are you moving around? Yeah, like yeah, so this is this is like an MVP proof of concept coordinator. Like I'll, I'm happy to do demonstrations after this of what we built that actually just saves the state with a login. So you're not having to like all have the same key name. I can just share my key with you and then you'll be a child X hub and then you can go sign, right? Like it's much more streamlined than than this, but it's still fun it's like that tool to have everyone interact without having that much hardware on. Uh, uh, so, yeah. so you think on the build, yeah. like a web portal where yeah. users can log in and it's basically the coordination, you get more in the web portal, you can work on that. Exactly. Yeah, so I'll just pull it up. Because we like two that size. So you log in, um, you actually get a list of all the vaults that you have, plus any vault that's been shared with you. This account doesn't have any, but just to show you, like, upload your key. You have the whole game here, the legend, cool card, expected DIY, uh, Jade, and the bit box. And you can just go step by step and upload your ledger, right? So step one, grab your table. Step two, plug in your ledger. Step three, type in your pin. Step four, open up the test that I have to connect. Set the next pub. But then what's interesting is that if I go to my keys page, right? So I have like these keys. I can actually share this key with you. So I can be like, your email at gmail.com. And then you just have access to my X Club and you can use that to coordinate with your own vaults, which is much more streamlined. And then when it's time to sign a transaction, you can request a signature from me, and it all kind of rolls up nicely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're the central coordinator with our solutions. Um, the smart vaults team is using Mouser to coordinate, which is an interesting model, and I think it's smart to use. Not for more things than just Twitter clones. Right. Actually, having it be uh, leveraging the other stuff like Oscar to actually do PSBTs, output descriptors, and doing that as a whole, like, message signing, 
all of that stuff can just be a threat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like the, the raw fragments, like the policy, there's and, there's or, there's special, there's a hash locks, there's keys, and there's time locks folder, and then after which is relative and absolute. And then four and reference. Yeah. So like ten. But like those are the common metrics that can do everything. Yes. It has. It ha it doesn't have the hash locks, but it has the time locks. Older is a relative time lock. After is an absolute time lock. And you can put in any block time scale before block height in a Right. That's my time. Thank you, everyone.